Gobble Gobble Club members, you've just entered into the dominion of First Issue Club podcast. Thanks for joining. Roll that beautiful music footage. Is that what we're doing now? <laughs> I like. I kind of like the like okay. the, cold, the cold intro. Hey, uh, I'm I'm not upset about it. Can you do a turkey noise? Was that, a turkey? that was a turkey <laughs> who has problems. <laughs> we that brought, turkey's being strangled. <laughs> <laughs> we brought a turkey here to, today, club members, because it's the Thanksgiving uh, edition of First Issue Club podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's Thanksgiving, and um, boy, are we thankful for you and for comic books and for the written word. <laughs> <laughs> the artistic uh, talent of people and the pen and ink and paper, <laughs> the paper press. This is going off the rails. <laughs> we got to honestly, this week was killing it, smashing it with books. Um, so we have a handful of really fun books to talk about. What do we have? What are we talking about this week, Greg? This week we're going to be covering Black Order from Marvel, Bitter Root by Image Comics, and Uncanny X Men by Marvel. Oh, uh, you know what we need to say? Oh. Uh, this is a recording on, what is today, the 18th? 18th. Um, Stan Lee passed away about five days ago, five or six days ago. Super sad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to take a time out here for a second to say goodbye to Stan and all the things that he did. Without him, I don't think any of us would really be here talking about comics. We got a question for you today. We live in a nice world. Well, it's <laughs> relatively <laughs> debatable. <laughs> we live in a world. We live in we, a world. We, we yes. don't. We don't have any ghosts listening to our podcast. So we have Unfortunately, to, yeah, we have to assume everybody listening to this podcast is living. Uh-huh. Um, unless, unless you uh, are listening to this like in a, a coma. Weird, yeah. Or a weird, I think you'd still be alive, though. I'm trying to think of a scenario where Listen, you Listen, if be- you're listening to this podcast and you're in a vegetative state, let us know on uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram. If you're listening to this and you're dead... Also, let us know. Yeah. So, we can start from the premise that we're thankful for being alive in this... Base, base level. <laughs> thankful for life. Gratitude Let's starts... Let's work from there. Hashtag gratitude starts there. Um... Okay, so uh, let's go around in the uh, club and say who we have in the club today and what we're thankful for. This is Budget King, and I am honestly thankful for Visine. I care. I have a strange addiction with my eyes drying out um, all the time, and I use Visine or... I probably shouldn't plug Visine so much. That's kind of weird. You should say eye drops? What do you call a thing that's not Visine? Eye drops? Yeah. Uh, clear eyes? Lubricant. Oh, you don't want to seem like brand particular. Yeah. I don't want to be like, yeah, that. I I do only buy Visine, if you're listening, Visine. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Visine. Mr. Mr. Mrs. Mrs. Visine. Big yeah. Visine. Yeah. Hope you're uh, um, Yeah, red eye reduction. In. Yeah. My eyes are constantly dry, and I couldn't imagine. If I was a stoner, I feel like my eyes would pop out of their head, but I just, <laughs> I cannot, uh... I can't moisturize my eyes enough. Do you so. wear contacts? No. You just have dry eyes? Very dry eyes all the time. And it might be that I have this, like, ever going on, ever uh, dependent on Visine and, like, eye drops. <laughs> but so the problem that has you're... caused itself, essentially, now? Yeah, probably. Your I, body just doesn't produce them anymore. I, every coat I own has a bottle of eye drops in it, and I'm thankful for them, Yeah, I think. Mm-hmm. This is Greg Lichtai, and the thing I am thankful for this year is the little sleeve that comes with the Hot Pockets that you can put in the microwave, and it helps cook them. Because I tried to cook a Hot Pocket without the real little microwave sleeve, and it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> Recently? And, uh, yeah. Was it a lean pocket? No. It was uh, like a, a cheese and pepperoni Hot Pocket, mm. and I don't know why it's it like did. Like a Calzone. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, isn't that what hot pockets basically are? I think so. Just calzones. They are, they are, but did you say you had pepperoni? Oh, Ooh. this is a while ago. Okay. Then yeah. Just checking. Are you correcting him? No, because he's been vegetarian for a while. Oh yeah. What? yeah. Dear God. When did that happen? Congratulations. Um, <laughs> it's been going on for how long? Probably about four, five months now. Wow. Four, four or five months. You don't eat the flesh. Nope. It's not. Mm-mm. Oh, do you, Caitlin? I try to be supportive, but I fail in doing that all the time. 
Yeah. Wow. It sucks because meat do, is I, delicious. It, it is, is. But salty, I have reduced my intake a lot mm-hmm. because it was something that he wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> so I am Mary Dangler, and I was actually <laughs> like worried about saying what I was thankful for because I was like, oh, it's so trivial and so first world, but then you said Visine and <laughs> Hot Pockets, and so I was like, <laughs> what I have to say is okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm very thankful for the fact that the Kansas City Chiefs are 8-1 and one <laughs> and leading the NFL this year. <clears throat> My name is Caitlin, and I have two. I have a two part. One is CBD. Mm. I have become. I'm a newcomer to the use and the application of it, but it has made my life so much easier. It just made me so much more calm. I have. I live with a lot of anxiety, just bubbling under the surface. So it's nice to like kind of clean that slate. Every once in a while. And then the second thing is also something that I use as a calming thing, but I really have only started doing this now or more recently as well, and that is baking and making cakes and getting covered in flour and creating something that people say looks cute and good, and it's nice. It's very therapeutic. I like that. I've never been the recipient of your baking. I will do. Honestly, I've only made two cakes, and they have been like crazy intricate fondant work. And Ooh, I don't know why really? I've never. Yeah. yeah, she crushed it. I don't know why I've never done it before. I'm not surprised. Because apparently it's something that I enjoy yeah, you doing. You made those diaper cakes for your sisters. Yeah, the onesie. Yeah, yep. yeah, they were really cute. Yep. Let's get this podcast started. started. First up, we got Black Order. I'm going to tell you what. Black Order was a sleeper this week. You may not have picked it up. We almost didn't cover it. But at no point in time is Thanos more popular than he is now. And you know what happens when a character or an entity is so popular? You give his henchman a comic book. The Black Order is a... I guess the henchman of Thanos, uh, originating in 2014 from a Thanos book, and they are the will of uh, Thanos. They've now broken off, though, I think. In the Black Order, we have five gods of sorts who are going to essentially just kind of end worlds, assassinate emperors, kill presidents, and they are black metal as fuck. They look really cool. They have cool names like... Proxima Midnight, Black Dwarf, Corvus Glove, Glaive, uh, Black Swan, and Ebony Maw. They all look like they stepped out of a Marilyn Manson and Behemoth <laughs> show. If that was all this comic book it was, then that would be fine for me. But we have a lot of internal crises and like probably some people that need to see therapy um, about their own uh, who they are in themselves. And especially the main person is really struggling with not being the funny guy. <laughs> Uh, and he yeah. wants to be the funny guy and he's like really working on his humor uh, and he like knows where everybody else sits in the uh, crew. It's written expertly. Well, right. even his girlfriend who's like, oh, you're depressed because you're not witty. Well, I'll pay more attention to the arch of your eyebrows in the future. Like being sarcastic back to him and mm-hmm. it's just a side you wouldn't really expect to see. But I don't know that it adds any humanity to him. I mean, for me, it didn't. Mm -hmm. But I guess I didn't really question why they were 
attacking these planets. I mean, other than the fact that they were evil, and I'm like, oh, they totally make sense to me. And they just want to kill everybody because they want to kill everybody. And black take clothing, over. got it. Yeah, They're like, bad. yep, yep, it's fine. They want to kill. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a, it's been a common like trope to flesh out villains and then make them like put something in their way that makes them you root for them right and so in this in this scenario they're going to get thwarted by the bad guy that they're trying to kill and you kind of find out like that bad guy that they're trying to kill or i guess neutral guy <laughs> is like kind of shitty and so and then you're kind of like rooting for them but for for me i would just i kind of like I like the idea of Thanos. I like the idea of Galactus. I like the idea of just like straight like just destruction for no reason. Uh, Neckbeard's also like Thanos a lot recently. <laughs> um, there's like a bunch of like Thanos was right shirts and things like oh that that God. are going around. Um, but so then to them to be like the embodiment of nihilism uh, and you're going to follow that through to its like uh, conclusion and then we're going to get a story behind that to me is like the brilliance of the Black Order, in a lot of ways. It's also called the Black Order, which sounds kind of metal. So. <laughs> yeah. You can also see the Black Order in uh, Infinity Wars. Yeah, that's a good point. If you want to see them it, I think in. So this author hasn't done a ton, but he's really well known for YA, this YA series that he does. And I just bent my comic book, which is pretty awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what series? Worthless. What series is it? It is called... What's... Harry Potter. <laughs> he's, he's, a pot, he's a pothead. This is J.K. Rowling. <laughs> also, this cover was pretty dope. There, Okay, so that cover is dope. There it's was a, a cover dope. this week for Black Order that came out that is fucking bananas, and people are losing their minds it over it. Is it not this one? It's not. No. And I it's like, like $180 one, So already. that's actually, like, okay, if we're being like completely, it's called the Skullduggery Pleasant, and there's a bunch of skeletons on it. The YA series? Yeah. Looks the pretty cool. Doggery. Mm. Um, <laughs> so looks like, like he's into ska. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's okay. Yeah, if we're being one hundred percent honest, the even reason why we're talking about this book today is because mm. that cover was insane. And yeah, that, that's what made it on the chain. And then a lot of people who are writing about that cover said. Actually, the book's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Surprisingly, the yes. book is fine. The book is like actually pretty hey, fun. Look inside. Why don't you? <laughs> yeah. Why don't you crack that cover? You won't regret Just it. Just like LeVar Burton told you to. <laughs> um, and then, and, and that's the thing about, I think, with Marvel publishing, you know, 50 new titles every, so many books. every Wednesday, for this to not even get any like talk about among uh, Marvel heads just doesn't really give this book much of a chance. And I think even for our listeners, which tend to be a little bit, probably tilt more towards the independent books, like you're probably going to pass over this book. But I think that it's a sleeper book. A sleeper is like the perfect term for this book in that it's like how fun and interesting it is. Right. And you'll fall asleep while reading it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's a nice, it'll, it'll lull you to sleep. Is this, I think it's only like a one of five too. Yeah, it is a short run. It seems like that's fitting. For what it's what it's given us so far in That's the first true. issue, because I'm not really sure I want to read an ongoing series for the Black Order. I don't know. I'd like to see them be incorporated, depending on where this leaves off, mm -hmm. like in other stories. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Bitterroot from Image co-created by Walker, Brown, and Green. The Sangurai family is at the core of this book, and they are sort of standing against these evil Janu. They are these monsters. Do they exist outside this book? Is this something that people are familiar with? I thought that it sounded familiar in there. Same. They're actually demonic. Yeah. Yeah. Taking over people in Harlem and in areas around Harlem, and the Sangurai family is sort of singularly standing up to kind of wipe these out or restore the humans, give them back their souls and, like, return them to their human state. And they're doing this, they're stopping them physically by going out and, like, beating them up and sedating the demons. And then they're also stopping them chemically with this serum that they're making. With that, there are some other really, really heavy-handed themes. It's more from the author's notes that that really came through. Like, I did get what the story was trying to achieve, but there was some really in-depth author's notes toward the end 
And I wanted to just shoot this question before we really get into it to you guys that did you did you get what did it come through what the authors were trying to say or did that like influence separately apart from the story? When they made it that these demons or the Janu or the things that they could be keeping in check was just straight up racism. Like they could be like keeping in check racist thoughts or people that are like just bad. <laughs> like I think yeah. they're extending that into that in in some ways. Yeah, this book to me stood uh, up to that, and it was like I got I got a well written story about the keepers of supernatural, but then it entered in this what I would call Afrofuturism book of like so, and I think you said this, but this all takes place in Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance, which is very significant. There's so many things in this that I think that it was really fun to like read and like explore. What I didn't love is, like, they invited a professor to, like, write, like, three pages about it. And honestly, I will say, like, reading it, I did was, like, I was, like, oh, shit, like, that's cool. But after reading it, I kind of was, like, it kind of cheapened it a little bit for me because I was, like, that was all in the book. And I, I didn't, I don't need a little essay about what I just read. Like, I could, if it's well written enough, let just don't. Oh, maybe I'll go t- see you speak at a con and you can tell me all that shit. Yeah. But don't give me the pamphlet inside the book. This is a great, a great comic book that doesn't need you to tell you why it's great. We were chatting Literally just a little bit about that. about that. But it it just kills me when you take when you take me out of the story and you take me out of that metacognition where I'm thinking about why I'm thinking about these things as I'm reading the book. And the people who would get a lot out of reading the author's notes are not necessarily who I want to be thinking about their own thought processes while reading this book. And so if you kind of want to make it accessible to that wider audience and get them thinking about things, I don't know that they're going to look at that and be like, I think that may turn some people away. And I don't think you should pander to those people. I don't. And take away from something that you really want to state about something that you've created, but it it just seemed to be like confu- more confusing to me than and I, I think sense. Yeah, I agree. I think in an era though where there are white nationalist publication in comics, and there's Comic Gates that's like basically empowering white nationalists, and then if this is the anti comic book to that. And it's like so smart, so intelligent, historically backed and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of like it as like it's not it's not even trying to be like super liberal for the sake of being like liberal or in in any ways. Mm -hmm. Really, I mean, it is an Afrofuturistic book and Afrofuturism. And I know that he even critiques that that terminology and, and, and he pushes another term for what this book might be. And he actually and I loved this. He actually talked about. The definition of Afrofuturism. Should I read that? Yeah. Coined by media scholar Mark Duray in 1993, the term was a moniker used to theorize the use of speculative narratives to deal with real world issues faced by African Americans. And then 2.0. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is now, and he references uh, Nettie uh, Akorafer, which we read uh, Shuri. But then he talks about how, like, Get Out, and then especially, like, the Boots Riley... Um, sorry to Bother You. Yeah, Sorry to Bother You movie, uh, about how that's, like, this new version, which he wants to term ethnogothic. And those two fucking movies are, are fucking brilliant. I just think that, like, those two movies are brilliant, and they didn't need to tell me that they were brilliant. They needed to tell me that they were in the same canon of each other. Don't give me this comic and tell me that it is the Get Out of comics. Right. You know? I... It, it is. It's great. Just, I don't know. I, that's, if that's going to be my one point of criticism on this, then it's not that really intelligent to say, I guess. But that <laughs> is like the thing that kind of just burnt it out, burnt it for me a little yeah. bit. Well, but at least three of us felt that way when we read it. So I think that the it seems the majority of people yeah. <laughs> based on that are, are maybe going to feel that way when they read it. So I think it's a good observation. I think, too, though, to that point, though, like, everybody reviewing this book, and this is a problem this podcast sometimes suffers from, yeah. is that, like, we're not people of color. And every b- person on this team is, I think. I looked them all up. 
they're telling a story that's like deep, deep cultural uh, heritage to them and, and part of like, it's the true beauty of what Afrofuturism is. I The thing I like about it and what the professor is talking about um, with the, the, the horrific other or this like the movies that he referenced and the supernatural components of these stories. And we talk, like I, I've mentioned it with like the Star Trek phenomenon too, where like you make like a different um, race of people or like a, like a supernatural or horror element like the Janu or like, well, I, I mean, just in some of the other movies that he's talking about. And it's it does make it easier to externalize the problem of race and, well, the construct of race and kind of explore themes within that while making it super entertaining because they're demons and they're like aliens or they're like but then putting that right alongside of like you said the real I think human racists like puts the problem in words that people can understand when they they don't otherness I, and yes yeah Next up, we got a doozy of a fucking comic book. Marvel pulled out all of the gates. They gave us a new Uncanny X-Men number one. And it was written by Ed Brisson and then Matthew Rosenberg and Kelly Thompson. And there was a buttload of artists and a buttload of cover arts and a buttload of inkers and all that kind of stuff. There's so many of those people because, and if you don't realize this when you're buying an $8 comic book, there is essentially three comic books in this comic. (laughs) So you are getting one hell of a story. Marvel is going all in on this. So you better like it because it's going to be filling up your comic book stores regardless (laughs) of how you feel about it. Yeah, next January there's like... (laughs) five different books that are spilling out from this. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. They already have like 35 books planned like in all this. My God. Nonsense. <laughs> this number one uh, book, there's actually, I would say there, it's it does three different things to set up what the story is of Uncanny X-Men is going to be. There's, there's kind of three different stories that are going on. One is that a time-traveling multiple man is coming back to find the right reality where Kitty Pride is. He's obsessed with finding Kitty Pride, and he is trying to thwart uh, this public thing that happens, right? So he, and we know that he's time traveling because he has the mark of the M on his eye, like Bishop does, from the future when mutants were branded. Right? Am I reading yeah. that correctly? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I believe so. Okay. So, so the public thing is because he's trying to, because the senator is also very much tied into what is happening with Kitty Pride. Yes. Um, okay. So that's that's once, this is, man, what a fucking mess yeah, this is. It's a ride. <laughs> okay. Uh, one very common story that happens in X-Men, which I always love, is they're bringing back this idea that they could end the gene. Um, and so there is a public entity, and the senator is representing that, of, of v- vaccinating X-Men or just mutants so that they could no longer give birth to mutants anymore. Right. right? They can still give birth, but the child won't have the mutant gene it would end, yeah. <clears throat> in its genetics. Yeah, they would essentially commit genocide through an, a nonviolent way. I mean, they would, yeah. right, which is... Not ending life, but ending the possibility of any mutation. I think brilliant. Yeah, which is a debate in itself, just that concept. Well, it's also kind of got real-world application yeah, I was because say, you can do that. There's a th- this has been tried before. Yeah. This is not a thing that X, the X on Kenny X-Men is <laughs> as, 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 a, as a thing. Okay, so we have that as, as a story going on. We have this really cool dynamic of, like, the B-team, A-team X-Men, the young X-Men um, versus, like, the, the higher-powered X-Men. And I think kind of um, championed by Psylocke yeah. is the person who's like being like, we're not like the B-team X-Men. We're, we're like g- good or whatever. And then um, <laughs> we're not junior varsity, <laughs> damn right. it. And then there's uh, on the on the better X-Men is like X20, <laughs> X-23. <laughs> on the uh, better X-Men. I don't know how to explain, right? The A-team X-Men? The, yeah. Um, X-23, Bishop, Storm, uh, Nightcrawler, things like that. Um, okay, so that's those are two stories, and then the third story is that uh, Kitty Pride is captured by some 
entity. Someone. We don't know who. Yeah. Someone that's very powerful and is able to, like, block things, like, people's powers a little bit, I think. And just randomly pluck people from their realm. Yeah, where they're hanging out. And we find that she is imprisoned with none other than also Apocalypse, who, if you don't know, is a villain. So that makes this super interesting. Yes. And the the random senator. And the random senator. The, there is a fourth little story in that Phoenix has come back to kind of take the lead of the X-Men, I guess, in Kitty Pride's um, absence. Yeah. She's like uh, interim. Wait, yeah. what? Oh, she's you like mean Jean Grey. The, she's, yeah, she's I'm being sorry. the public I meant, face. Yeah, I said Phoenix. I meant Jean Grey. Yeah, Fe- sorry. Phoenix isn't around. It's just Jean Grey. Yep, sorry. It's just, I meant, sorry. So You're good. redact I, that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was redact following. it. Okay, uh, Jean Grey comes back and leads the X Men in that in a uh, in Kitty Pride's absence. Mm-hmm. Um, there's kind of this weird story that happens there that we don't even need to get into, where like humans' bodies are being possessed. There's a lot fucking happening in this book. <laughs> yeah, but it also took me an hour to read. I mean, this is a fucking graphic novel. It's dense. There's like over eighty pages in this thing. If yeah. you, if you are gonna uh, if you love X Men, then file this away in your spank bank because you you got <laughs> your your fucking jollies off and a half. This... Anytime I turn a co- like the inside cover and I've got a cast of characters, that's like twenty people yeah, long. Yeah, you just there's just a there's a second of like. Oh, just, <laughs> I'm not gonna remember just, any of yeah, these people. I just can't. That's what it is. That's how I feel. My brain goes. Oh. Well, you know what my brain did? It went oh. He, you're gonna be rich because uh, <laughs> when Mojo came out and you bought yourself, Glob. you bought yourself the first appearance of Glob. <laughs> I knew it. That's what I was thinking. You're, Globby's back. Yeah, Glob's back. The if, banter between so, like the junior varsity team within one another is like pretty funny though, because they're just like the same teenagers are just like trying to prove themselves and like. Yeah, but I kind of just wanted to smack them around and be uh-huh. like, "You don't get it." And it's so clear. Well, that's what you're supposed Just to. Just go do your teen thing somewhere else. I mean, there is a, every X Men that you recognize is probably on the A team. If you are a person that doesn't really know that much about X Men, when you see people like Pixie, Rockslide, Oya, oh yeah, um, Glob, and uh, <laughs> Armor, those are going to be the B team that yeah, they're talking about. Yeah, this is like uh, Saved by the Bell new class. Like, it, there, yeah. there's some familiar faces, but mostly it's uh, uh, subpar characters. Archangel is in this, oh, which that is was weird. fucking awesome. Um, but also part of the mysterious what Yeah, so, th- so I think they're going to bring in, it looks like they're going to bring in the reverse of the, when they did the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Um which is that word is the reverse of apocalypse is salvation. salvation. <laughs> is that what they're called? I'm going, yeah. I'm turning to the ad. So it's the four horsemen of salvation. Mm-hmm. Um, and it looks like Archangel is going to be one of those. So is he getting called away in this book by the other? Um, by the others? He looks, to, he's some God entity. Like, I, I don't know. But he was summoned away, clearly, because yes. he leaves everyone yeah. in the midst of this battle. Yeah, like he was like talking to someone, and yeah. then he just left. So he's maybe being called away for a higher purpose. Yeah. I will say the uh, the ad they have for Uncanny X-Men 4, when they introduce the Four Horsemen of Salvation, looks fucking epic. And just there's just no way that... I don't even know how they're going to get to that from this story that we got here. Yeah. Uh, and so they have some big ass things planned. Well, this. how is that advert not spoiling any of the storyline that we're in how, right how now? Spoilies. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, this is naive. How often do you, in a comic book, do you get an ad for a comic book that's three issues yeah, away? That's, I don't that know. Odd. Mary, you were saying that like, as a, as a re for you, uh, Right. <clears throat> so I don't have a lot of background knowledge on X-Men. I've watched the movies. <laughs> but as as someone coming in and just reading it, I didn't feel super lost. I felt like I understood most of what was going on. But then again, as someone who doesn't have the background, it's hard yeah. to say what I'm missing out on because I don't know. Which is funny because I, I like to think I have somewhat of a pretty good background on the X-Men, and I was confused as fuck. <laughs> and I, I think that here is the what happened, though, is like, when I was like, wait a minute, why is multiple man looking like this? Like, what's going on here? For a person that doesn't that know that, I, I don't think they're taking that time to be like, 
wait, why? They're just like, oh, this is the story. This guy's like thwarting this, like uh, vaccines for mutants. Okay, I get it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think they did a good job with that. We're not, uh, you know, I'm I'm baggaged down with the minutia of the previous yeah. X Men timeline, where I'm just like, oh, wait, wait, just a minute, uh, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> I also don't know how the X Men world works, so I'm used to other storylines. That's okay. I need to like... do most of the writers <laughs> that write for X Men. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Like, Shots fired. <laughs> Batman or Star Wars or whatever that. N- that are not always succinct. You know, the storyline yeah. changes depending on the writer, depending on oh God. the yeah. director, if you're talking about the movies or whatever. So that's kind of what I assumed kind of going into this is it's, I don't know who's writing it. I don't know. Here's what I like about Star Wars movies and comics. They don't. Hard left. They don't <laughs> divulge into like different timelines. Don't get me started on Star Wars. <laughs> I know, but you know, what, like, there's like we're de- in this in this book alone, Uncanny X Men, we're dealing with maybe two or three different timelines. Yep. We have Dark and, Beast and multiple realities. We have, and multiple yeah. realities. We have Dark Beast. We have uh, Age of Apocalypse guy coming in that is from another uh, future reality. Yeah. And it's just like it, it, it's it's a it's an amalgamation of every bad acid trip. <laughs> that anyone's ever had, and they're just like, we should write this down. The, and the other thing, too, about it is that they actually are trying to keep in line with all of the other books that are going on right now. Yeah. So they like, it's, they're not just like, oh, don't, or DC will do this sometimes. Well, they'll say, don't look over here, mm-hmm. this like mini series <laughs> title. It has no <laughs> canonical uh, like implications. Yeah. It, Marvel went all in and they're like, yep, okay. So it's uh, like close up magic. Just like, <laughs> don't look over here, look over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me tell you this too. Um, Shame on Marvel for not. Oh uh, wow! <laughs> well, a little wag of the finger. I am gonna, I'm gonna start the clock. I'm gonna hard. I'm hard wagging my finger on this. Shame on you, fuckers, for uh, you knew the condition that Stan Lee was in. So like, you should have Insta Press like fucking tributes that come yeah. out that that printed. Yeah. I don't give That's a, a good shit point. if like he died on whatever day. You need to be able to turn that fucker around and put some like some celebration immediately. shit uh, immediately for your fucking well, the father of everything you did. You think I, they're gonna come out in the next week? Oh, for sure. Next weeks are gonna be oh, it's bonkers. riddled. Yeah, riddled with them. But they, they, I think well, he they, died on Monday, right? No, because like he passed away on Monday. Is that was it Monday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so like to so get, I immediately take back everything to I get said. something out <laughs> by Tuesday or Wednesday would be like I don't care. I think oh, do God. it or send send something to the comic book stores. I'm just saying like no, I know. pull out all the stops, spend some extra money. Like you needed, they needed to do that. I think. I feel like this week you'll be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I will be. But it's too little, too late. <laughs> too little, too late. You've already <laughs> hurt me too much, Marvel. Yeah, I don't know. This is a book that blacked out the sun, so we could not not cover it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's really hard to cover it, and I'm sure that you went somewhere else to get all your actual jollies off of it. <laughs> but as far as a review for the people that are listening to this podcast, uh, try it out. I guess it was not. <laughs> it's not terrible. <laughs> give give it a shot. <laughs> Give it a whirl. If you like every other X Men book, you'll definitely <laughs> like this. Yeah. If you like, um, like running a marathon cold turkey <laughs> after having never <laughs> run before, you might like this book. Um, if you've ever stuck a needle in your urethra, Jeez. you might like this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For this pleasure. Is, yeah. Um, <laughs> this is like you. This comic book is like if you overheard someone talking about Bitcoin in a coffee shop and then you spent $4,000 buying Bitcoin. It is not like that at all. <laughs> that isn't bad. That if you, half I read. If you like having a bunch of questions that you know are not going to be answered but having a building suspend, like, suspense the entire time towards something that's going to be absolutely bonkers, then you will like this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Give a good review. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what, too, Galen, to that point um, – this comic book has like uh, indelibility that like it's it would be fun to own and go back and be like oh like 
not only even rereading, but just like looking up things, like piecing things together. And I think that few comic books pulled that off. Yeah. So for that alone, like you bought yourself a comic book that you're actually going to read more than once, which is more than half my collection. So <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, I think, it, I think it also backs up your point earlier that it is probably more accessible to people who haven't jumped on X-Men before because you're probably it's probably going to spur you into other research that will get you into something more than it would like somebody who feels like they already have a great deal of knowledge about X-Men. You're not going to really be looking stuff up or getting trying to get more from the story, but you could be as a new fan. Yeah, this is gonna. Uh, this is a dumb question, and then we can end the podcast. But what is the difference between X Men and X un- Uncanny X Men? It's a different team. But this is every team. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> it's like asking what's uh, the difference between uh, Avengers and New Avengers, well, New Avengers, well, or Dark Avengers, or to be fair, they, to be fair, to be fair. They um, aren't the A team's not there in the beginning for any reason other than what starts happening. It does start with the B team. So I guess like is Cyclops not going to be in this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's a bad example. Uh, well, oh, I was going to say Wolverine, also a bad example. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm trying to think of like a major X Men that's well, not. Well, Storm's in this. I mean, I there's Wolverine's not in this. He's dead. No, he's well. He's back now. Okay, he was dead. Yeah, but as we know in comics, no one stays <laughs> dead for long. Uh, Professor X, not in this. Dead, probably dead. Likely dead. More than likely dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> anybody else? Oh, Gambit. There we go. Rogue and Gambit. They're not in here. There you go. Jubilee's so, in there. Jubilee's in here. Yeah, Rogue and Gambit. Do- so that's that's the difference. So we, we figured it out. <laughs> the difference between X-Men well, and Uncanny still, X-Men is Rogue and they're Gambit. They're still having relationship troubles on an island somewhere, I would assume. <laughs> they got married. But do you think that means they won't be in future issues? Oh, who knows? <laughs> this team lineup will change that's what, I in mean, the next yeah, five issues. But I mean, if you, if you think that's the difference, that may not be the I, difference. I honestly don't know the difference between Uncanny X-Men and X-Men besides... Marvel wanting to make double the money off the X-Men franchise. I mean, I've been sitting here trying to come up with something really smart to say, and <laughs> I couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. all of us all the time in this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm looking it up to see if Google has any, like... <laughs> what, Dear Google, what is the difference? Dear Google. Dear Google, Greg what doesn't know what is the difference. It's the longest running series in the X Men series, so it predates um, all new X Men, or or just X Men. Okay. So, I think it's just what they call X Men. What? Yeah, I don't. I don't think that there's just an X Men title. So. Okay. There's a lot of articles dedicated to what is the difference <laughs> between X Men. Oh, did, is X-Men. there anything that you can glean? Mm. The ma- Uncanny is about the main force of the Utopia team. X-Men is about the security force. <laughs> Does that mean anything to anyone here? So the Utopian team is the team that's dedicated in the betterment of mutant kind and humankind living together. The security team is... The team that probably goes out and deals with, uh, like, the main villains and, like, the violence against mutants and vice versa. Well, but, shit. And that's weird, though, because this is uncanny, which may, which by that logic would be more of the utopian, but they're getting infiltrated by mm-hmm. more of the X-Men universe. Yeah, because do you remember... <sighs> well, X-Men, X-Men Colors is going on with X-Men Red, Blue, Black... Green, Jade, Aquamarine. <laughs> and so they're like different teams doing that. And X-Men Red was Jean Grey that was primarily the utopian team of just like, can't we all live together? Fuck it, I can't even begin. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, that's a rabbit hole. <laughs> this was an episode. A, f- <laughs> a flepisode. This, a, was, a, this is the Thanksgiving episode. And boy, are we full. Yep. Gobble, gobble. Uh, well, (laughs) (laughs) 
It was the best turkey impression you did all night. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's getting better. Thank you. It reminds me of planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> the part where she's sitting at the counter and Steve Martin's waiting for her, her to get off the phone. I, I'm you just saying her to, like you know you who I'm talking to show it to about? me, but I fell asleep, remember? Oh. Well, anyway, Ooh. she's on the phone and she says, gobble, gobble, and then she goes, <laughs> oh, that was and good, every yeah. time every somebody does that, it reminds me. <clears throat> the sound for Thanksgiving should be more like. <sighs> I just think of somebody like slurping gravy. Is that what yeah, you're going for? I'm a gravy. I slipper. was like, Wait, is this how just you eat your sipping, turkey? Sipping gravy. <laughs> it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> Just took my bong rip. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Oh, that made me feel gross. Thank you. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, I hope that you enjoy your holiday season kickoff with First Issue Club. This has been a First Issue Club productions by uh, First Issue Club members. (laughs) And we have music done by Primary Color Music. <laughs> Edited and produced by Matthew Hodap. Who's both attractive in his abilities and physical appearance. <laughs> uh, we are recorded in KCUR st- 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 Studios. 89.3. And we, we are, are a proud member, member of the Found, Found City, City Frequency, Frequency Family of Podcasts. Well, that was great. We yeah. looked into each other's eyes as we that said that. That frightened me. I can barely say that solo, but when, when we did that in unison, it was really perfect. With our powers combined. It's like Pacific Rim. We would be better, the robot, <laughs> together. Like, yeah, together. yeah, exactly. Controlling it together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, that's a wrap, y'all. It's a wrap. We are on uh, social medias, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Gmail, uh, find us on iTunes, five-star review, and leave us a... Uh, what a, fuck? Comment? Uh, yeah, yeah. Comment. A comment or a review. A review. Sorry. Yeah. I said five star review, and I jumped the gun. We on We can myself. take that. We'll take that too. A five star review. Yeah. Rate us five stars, then give us a review. Boom. That's what I wanted to say. Boom. This is Budget King and <laughs> slurp that gravy. <laughs> oh God. I didn't. I don't. Did you know you had to have a sign off, Mary? No. You you gotta have a sign. Just like a special way to say goodbye. Oh, you have yeah. to sing uh, the <laughs> kryptonite. <laughs> kryptonite. That's what we made Heather do. <laughs> no, <laughs> Heather was I a don't trooper. Even like that song. Mm, I don't think Heather did. Uh, yeah, I don't think she didn't like it either. And she said, "What was yours? I didn't even hear you do." I one. haven't done mine yet. Oh, do you want to go last? Yes. Okay. I know her. Um, this is Greg Lichtai, <laughs> yes. and I just want to say thank you to all of. Uh, audience people who listen and rate and talk to us on in- Instagram. Uh, I want to say thank you to Stan Lee for all he did. I want to say thank you to all the club members for letting me hang out with you guys every week and talk about comic books. I love each and every one of you. Caitlin a little bit more, but uh, that is to be expected. Gross. Uh, and this is me signing off. I'm Caitlin Morosic and I will show myself out. That's cute. <clears throat> I'm Mary Dingler. I just want to say thank you to the First Issue Club for having me. And have a happy Thanksgiving. Hey, all right. Bye. <laughs>